The Lord before us, who can be against us? Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals. We're in the historiographer and a title Amateur Archivist by John Rawlinson. Reverend John Rawlinson is the archivist of Church Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley. A critical archival policy relates to who has direct access to the collection. Access should be carefully and specifically determined by the highest decision-making authority and published as a digital or printed document. The policy should identify the holders of specific offices as having direct access. Naming the office rather than the individual name means that it is not necessary to change the policy when there's no change in a particular office. And we'll just skip this and go to the history of direction, spiritual direction of GTS. A new book on the history of spiritual direction at General Theological Seminary is set to fill electronic bookshelves this summer. Melissa Chim, reference librarian and archivist at GTS, and Dr. Ann Silver, the seminary's director for the Center for Christian Spirituality, have written a new textbook entitled History of the Center for Christian Spirituality. The book explores the beginning of the in 1966 against the backdrop of women's ordination and the new interest in spiritual direction as a discipline. It also traces the development of the prog program from once weekly Thursdays at general courses to degrees and certificates. The book utilizes 30 boxes of material from the seminary's archives that span from the period of the 1970s to 2001. <coughs> it includes a discussion on the importance of the archives of living history. This text is what's known in the library community as an OER, Open Educational Resource. ORs are completely free to access and read electronically anywhere and anytime by anyone. The authors were given the opportunity to create this text through the generous founding of the ATLA OR Invention Grant. This text will be published online in July 2022. We'll pass on from that to Table Talk. The June issue on anger. We're finishing the article on the rhythm of forgiveness. We'll pick up a second article as well. It's easy to misread the petition of the Lord's Prayer as if it were saying that forgiving others is the sufficient condition of being forgiven ourselves. This is especially easy to do when we consider what Jesus says immediately after the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If fear forgiving were the sufficient condition of our forgiveness, then it would be the cause of our forgiveness. Forgiveness would not then be by the grace of God. Our forgiving others is not the sufficient condition of our forgiveness, but is a necessary condition, or better, fruit of our forgiveness. Our forgiving others does not cause our forgiveness, but it does accompany it. We cannot truly forgive others unless we experience God's forgiveness in Christ. It is our experience of the Father's love for us through the Son that enables us to resemble our Father in the act of forgiveness. The primary rationale that we are given in the New Testament for why we ought to forgive one another is resemblance. The Apostle said, be kind to one another. 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive, grounding both commands and the definitive forgiveness of the Father and Son, as children of the Father and brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus. We're called to resemble him through forgiveness. There is a dreadful flip side to our call to resemble the Father in forgiving others, those whose lives are characterized by unforgiveness will themselves be unforgiven and will be judged apart from Christ. This is a sober warning that Jesus often attached to his teaching about forgiveness. Are you living in the rhythm of forgiveness? A life that is lived this way is marked by a willingness to go to the Lord with one sin, confident of having been justified by faith alone in Christ alone. A life that is lived in this way is marked by a willingness to be reconciled with others, whether one sins against another or is sinned against. We are not living in this rhythm. We must go to the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Through his forgiveness, he will establish us in this rhythm a rhythm that all starts with him of asking for forgiveness from others and extending forgiveness to others. If we are living in this rhythm, we must go to the Lord and praise him for the grace in which we stand. Let us take for joy in every opportunity we have to extend forgiveness to others and in so doing resembling that of our heavenly Father. We now turn to an article by Dr. David Brionis, Associate Professor of New Testament at Westminster Seminary and Teaching Elder in the OPC, the author of Paul's Financial Policy. The title is A Life Worthy of the Gospel of Christ. In Philippians 1.27, Paul exhorts the community to do one thing in his absence, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In this way, Paul says, your worthy lifestyle will be a clear sign of your salvation. At first glance, it seems that Paul, the apostle of grace, is promoting a salvation by works. It seems that we somehow need to prove ourselves worthy of the gospel before receiving salvation of all the work of salvation falling into the lap of the believer. You will certainly find this perspective in both ancient and modern views of salvation. But is this self-saving message promoted by the Apostle Paul? A closer look at Philippians 1.27 provides the answer. The Greek verb Paul at Humanoi translated, let your manner of life be, is a command. By using the verb, Paul evokes the image of a city. Paul at Humanoi is derived from polis, meaning city. According to Aristotle, the city in ancient Greece was likened to a partnership or fellowship. Each citizen incurred the mutual obligation to carry out civic duties. Yet the city Paul has in mind distinguishes it from all others in one monumental way. The constitution of this city is the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the legislation to which the Philippians must conform. They must conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the demands. But what does it look mean to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? The answer is found in 127 and 28. So whether I come or see you or I am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. 
With one spirit and one mind, Christians at Philippi constitute a single body. But unlike secular societies, they stand and strive for the faith of the gospel. They are to stand united against danger for the sake of Christ without becoming frightened by their opponents. But what does this refer to? This points back to the whole of 127 and 28. The Philippians united steadfast resolve for the gospel in the midst of opposition and suffering is precisely what Paul meant by living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. If we were to stop there, it would logically follow that if believers out of some innate worth prove themselves worthy of the gospel, then their actions will result in ultimate salvation. Is this another version of the be a good person and God will save you? No. Paul cleverly inserts a subtle yet powerful phrase that completely underlines that line of reasoning and that from God. That not only points to salvation in the same verse, but also reaches further back to the whole of the Philippians' worthy conduct. This may seem insignificant, but it is vital to understand the text. The ultimate salvation and worthy conduct are from God. They are God's gift of free grace. This means that a believer's salvation is given rather than earned, and that a believer's worth is divinely created rather than naturally cultivated. It is God who enables their steadfast unity in the gospel. Sensing the need to provide a reason for this theologically weighty claim, Paul continues in 129, For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. The word granted, related to the world grace, once again depicts God as the primary giver in this heavenly city, the one who graces the community with a threefold gift of faith, suffering, and salvation. Number one, believing in the gospel grants entrance to the city. Two, suffering coupled with the divinely granted perseverance of the community characterizes the Christian life in this city. And three, salvation is the end which the civil, for which the heavenly city was constructed. All this from start to finish is brought into being by God's grace. Truly, God begins and ends the Christian life. We do not work whether in our own effort or with God's assistance to become people worthy to receive salvation. That's how the world thinks. That is why the gospel of Christ is so unnerving to the world. It powerfully subverts every worldly notion of worth and salvation. Sinners with no worth of their own who believe and rest in the gospel of grace become worthy in Christ. Sinners are neither worthy nor godly from Christ. It is only when we receive Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, that we are declared righteous or worthy in Christ. And we know that those whom God declares righteous are, subsequently, actually made righteous. My hope is that Paul's prayer would become our own as we continue depending on the grace of God to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. To draw that to a close as we shift <coughs> to the July edition of Salt and Light, picking up an article here. The 
middle of an article, Living Quietly and Working Diligently as Light by Matthew Lohman. Furthermore, we should mind our own affairs, 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Christians shouldn't meddle in the affairs of others. We should not gossip and to try to know everything better. We should be single-minded about what God has given us to do. Obviously, it's fine to be distracted by seeing people in need and then come alongside them. This is not what Paul is talking about. Yet we all know how easy it is to get pulled into things that shouldn't be our concern. Finally, Paul exhorts to work with your hands. There is a call to diligence at work. Thessalonians expected the immediate return of Christ. In their excitement and eager anticipation, they neglected their work. But such idleness isn't pleasing to God. While very few Christians will go so far, some might be tempted to think that it might be pleasing to God if they do the bare minimum at work in order to have more time to do what they consider more significant things for God. This is probably well-intentioned, but is not what God's Word teaches. Here's Paul's instruction to servants. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye services, bend pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Our job at work is to be quiet, to mind our business and work diligently and faithfully. We should do all of this that we may walk properly before outsiders. In other words, so that we should be salt and light at our workplaces. After all, most of us will work surrounded by non-Christians. The way we go about our work will be an important aspect of our witness. God will use our diligent work to provide for us so that we may be dependent on no one. Instead, we will be able to make up for what will, is lacking in the diligence of others. All this will strengthen our Christian witness and might well be used by God to draw others to himself. And now for an article by Reverend Mike Riccardi, pastor of local outreach ministries at Grace Community Church an assistant professor of theology at Master's Seminary, above reproach, inside and out. Before moving on from his discussion of 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, of the qualification for elders of Christ's church, the Paul, Paul concludes in verse 7 by requiring elders to enjoy a good reputation with unbelievers. Such a requirement seems to go without saying. The gospel commission is central to a pastor's life and calling. Yes, he must equip the saints for the work of ministry. By working hard in preaching and teaching, endeavoring to present every member complete in Christ. But the commission to make disciples begins with doing the work of an evangelist proclaiming the gospel to those who are outside in the hope that by God's grace they may be converted and be joined to the body of Christ. A pastor constantly prays that outsiders would become insiders, that unbelievers would be transformed into disciples of Christ, or then gathered into the church to be baptized and taught to observe all that Christ has commanded. Yet upon a moment's reflection, such a requirement can seem quite counterintuitive. Unbelievers are spiritually dead, hostile to God, and unable to accept and understand the things of the Spirit of God. Can we really expect them to prove, approve of elders of Christ's church? those who stake their lives on the very Bible whose authority unbelievers reject. 
Jesus himself reminded his disciples that the unbelieving world hated him and would hate his followers. Our great prop, prophet pronounced woe on us when all men speak well of us, for that is how the false prophets were received. An entire generation of pastors has sold out to the pragmatist's philosophy of ministry. If we can get the unbelievers to like us, then they'll accept Jesus. Perhaps no other principle has done more to weaken the church in the past 30 years. But Paul says, what we proclaim is not ourselves. How then can he demand that pastors must be well thought of by outsiders? The answer requires that we understand what Paul is not calling for. He is not setting aspiring elders on a course to court esteem and the admiration of the enemies of righteousness. This qualification does not require the man of God to escape criticism of those who are blind to the glory of the gospel. John Calvin observed how stupid we would be to want to be liked by those who despise God and who trample our Lord Jesus underfoot. We should indeed expect the wicked to mock and reject us, seeing that we cannot persuade them to honor as they should and submit reverently to his word. Pastors and elders must never forget that the wisdom of this world is folly with God and that we his servants are, as Paul says, the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Instead, the apostle is calling for elders to live above reproach, not only above reproach of those inside, as he called for in 1 Timothy 3.2, but above reproach of those outside the church. Sometimes a perspective of elders, unbelieving relatives, co-workers, or neighbors may know more about his character than fellow church members. If unbelievers know him to be marked by immorality or drunkenness, or by lack of dis discipline or integrity, while at the same time he's serving as an elder in Christ's church, they will ridicule him as a hypocrite and the name of Christ will be blasphemed because of it. Paul requires this not to be so. Though enemies of the truth will seek to discredit the character of God's witnesses, elders must keep their conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they are slandered, those who revile good behavior in Christ must be put to shame. Good afternoon, Mary. If charges are brought, they must never stick, and they must be shown to be illegitimate by the clear appeal to a man's life. May God give grace to his servants that they might walk worthy of such a high calling. Good to see you, Mary. We're now in the standard bearer with Reverend Dennis Lee on an overview of Revelation and the white horse and uh, Jesus Christ as the executor of the contents of the book of eternal decrees. The cleansing work of the white horse and its riders takes place in the way of spiritual warfare. The horse and also the bow of the rider, which is his weapon, both speak of war. The white horse and the rider are constantly fighting a great spiritual war that began, began long ago when God drew a line in the sand between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The white horse fights and wars against Satan, tearing down his strongholds. Everywhere and throughout time and history, we see the all-conquering effect of this horse, the elect of God held captive by the power of sin are freed by the gospel power of the cross. 
and being so graciously freed by God through such an awesome, almighty, all-conquering power. They live the holy, loving, thankful lives empowered by his spirit and word. They therefore cannot help but give witness of their great salvation. It is in this way that the white horse, empowered by the almighty and invincible power of God, in and through Christ, <coughs> continues running its course on earth through time and history. The victorious running, as the white horse does, it fights, conquers, and is always triumphant. Whenever and wherever this white horse is sovereignly unleashed by Jesus, it subdues his foes and frees the chosen, undeserved, captive people of God. The victorious running is set forth at the end of verse 2. <clears throat> and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. For the crown here is not a king's crown, but the crown of a victor at the end of a race or contest. Notably, this white horse and rider was already crowned victorious by the sovereign God before it set out on its running. It is not such a comforting and reassuring word. Is that not such a comforting and reassuring word for all of us who love Christ's church among us and see her in the present troubles and great needs? Christ is in total control and the white horse continues its victorious running through the preaching and witness of the gospel of Christ in our own small circle of churches or sister churches our mission fields and far beyond us in every faithful church and mission circle on earth including all his elect in war-torn countries and wherever persecution is experienced the victorious running is seen in two ways. First, the white horse continues to run through all times. It is unstoppable. Great and powerful kingdoms and nations, many of which have been and continue to be hostile towards the gospel of Jesus Christ, have come and gone. But the church stands on the earth. The elect remnant of God with her gospel word continues to abide. The gospel word continues to spread throughout the globe, even through war and persecution. The running of the white horse is unstoppable and therefore victorious. Second, the white horse is victorious even when the preaching and witness of the gospel yield negative results. When people hear it, reject it, condemn it, and live in rebellion against Christ and his word. For it is not the faithful preacher and the believer, but the exalted Christ himself, who governs the results of the faithful preaching and witness of the gospel. For the inspired Paul describes faithful teachers as a sweet savor of Christ, portraying the sweet word brought by them in a twofold way, a savor of life unto life to some, and a savor of death unto death to others. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. And so we say together with the inspired apostle, apostle, who is sufficient for these things? The gospel word softens, but it also hardens. It brings life and strengthens true life and love to some but it also brings death and causes deeper hatred and rebellion against God and his people. In this twofold way, the run of the white horse is always triumphant, always victorious, and it will continue fighting, conquering, and tearing down every stronghold of Satan decreed in God's eternal counsel. Till every last one of God's captive children are brought into the kingdom of light from the kingdom of darkness. 
and the cup of iniquity filled to the brim through the rejection of the gospel of the white horse, through the strife, division, and war of the red horse, through the economic struggles and greed of mankind of the black horse, and finally through the pale horse of death, and then Christ shall return in judgment. What a tremendous comfort and assurance for us. Our thankful response. What ought be the response of all who receive the gospel of the white horse and its wonderful life-giving and life-strengthening effects? May it be a humble response of thankfulness. May this thankful response be made manifest by her preachers in clear and faithful preaching and teaching of the word. We will bring that bring that to an end. And now we turn to Bibliotheca Sacra and the Exegesis of Psalm 49 and the author's thesis of communion with God in the afterlife being delivered from Sheol. The context is fraught with expectations of divine fellowship and sacred change. The verb zavad, which means serve, and shamar, which keep, occur elsewhere in this pattern only in the priestly law governing Levitical duties with respect to the tabernacle. In two other well-known passages, the term lachach, describes the divine translations of Enoch, John 5.24, and Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 3 and following, who are miraculously transported into the presence of Yahweh. Abram uses the, Abraham uses the term to, to denote that Yahweh took him from his household and father's house to bring him into the promised land so that his destiny and that of his descendants would be linked vitally and irrevocably to the land. In the priestly regulations, Yahweh takes the Levites in the place of the firstborn sons of Israel to be his unique representatives. He's talking about the Hebrew word, lachach. On a few other occasions, lachach assumes covenantal overtones in expressing God's election of the nation Israel and regathering of the people in the eschaton. Yahweh also takes Lachach, David from the sheepfold to be the king over his people, verses, and takes certain of David's descendants to fulfill a special mediatorial role. Due to the failings of the Davidic kings, however, he occasionally takes other rulers temporarily to fulfill his purposes. In the Psalms, Yahweh takes, again talking about the verb lachach, takes the faithful one prior to Psalm 18.16 or at death, Psalm 49.15 and then later Psalm 73.24, that great text to deliver him from the enemies in this life or in the next. On the negative side, on a handful of occasions, Yahweh takes someone in judgment, implying death, destruction, or exile. In the case of the latter, the context applies in each situation to divine punishment for corporate sin on the part of the nation. From these passages, we may conclude that in the majority of cases, Yahweh takes the individual as a result of or in confirmation of an existing special relationship. The individual is brought into the realm of blessing and occasionally also a, a sacred charge whereby the individual sustains a singular responsibility and relation with God. In the context of Psalm 49.15, which he's been exegeting, and of Psalm 73.24, which is coming up, the taking of a believer, presumably at or after death, 
implies the continuation of this distinctive relationship in the realm of blessing and fellowship with Yahweh in the afterlife. We bring that to a close. And now for modern reformation. Thankfully, we ended the last article uh, by Jordan Stefaniak that was complaining almost a little bit of a temper tantrum about biblicism. I don't think he made much. I don't think he ended. He didn't start well and didn't end well. We start a new article, Evangelical Biblicism over the years, an interview with Blake Adams with Timothy Larson. In 2020, InterVarsity Academic Press published an anthology on the history of evangelical biblicism titled Every Leaf, Line, and Letter, Evangelicals in the Bible from the 1730s to the present. For this issue, Blake Adams interviewed Dr. Timothy Larson, the editor of Every Leaf, Line, and Letter. Larson is the McManus Professor of Christian Thought at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Much of his published scholarship concerns the global history of evangelicalism since its appearance in 18th century England, and his expertise provides a historical bedrock for discussing Biblicism today. Blake Adams is an associate at the Church of the Resurrection in Wheaton, Illinois, which is out your way, Matt, Mary, in Chicago. Here's the question. What is Biblicism in historical evangelism? Answer. At root, Biblicism is about the Protestant conviction of Sola Scriptura, that the Bible alone is the final authority for Christian faith and practice. For evangelicals, sola scriptura does not have implications just for theology. It is also about worship. The right kind of worship service for the congregation is one in which scripture is read. There's a sermon that expounds the scripture. How about a Bible liturgy and biblical hymns? It is also about individual spirituality. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to have a discipline of regular Bible reading as an individual. Historically, evangelicals tended to emphasize family devotions, which included Bible reading, such as my great grandparents out on the farm reading the Bible at breakfast, lunch, and dinner on a chapter. Farm people. Often you would have one member read aloud a portion of scripture every evening to the rest of the family. This was a way of emphasizing the importance of scripture at that level. The individual level, family level, and congregational level are all involved the historic evangelical definition of biblicism. So historical evangelical biblicism in both doctrine and practice. In David Bevington's famous quadrilateral, which is a famous book that I think is a tad bit overrated, biblicism was meant to emphasize that evangelicals are orthodox Christians. So they believe that what Christians have believed historically, which I think is right. There are other people who use Biblicism in different ways. Sometimes they use it to mean a simplistic appeal to texts as a way to solve an argument. There's proof texting connotations for some uses of the term. Bevington's use of Biblicism does not mean that. He means a value that orients the Christian. So we'll continue that. Calvin's Theological Journal and the Beatitudes in the Life of the Church. The Empire of Heaven, as Carter likes to translate it. 
conquers the empire of this world as disciples obey the king of the empire. Where it conquers, there is justice and peace, of which humanity, apart from his reign, knows nothing. The first and eighth of the Beatitudes both end with the phrase, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This inclusion suggests that the Beatitudes describe the kingdom of heaven, which has drawn near and how it's manifest now. The audience lies in obedience, your answer lies in obedience to Jesus's commands, which are succinctly summarized in the Beatitudes. That is, it is manifest where disciples motivated by the promise of blessedness do the acts of the last four Beatitudes on behalf of those conditions in the first four. Concurrently, those in the condition of the first four are motivated to join themselves to the community of Jesus by this blessedness. As Powell puts it, all of the first four Beatitudes speak of a reversal of circumstances for those who are unfortunate. Contrary to popular homiletical treatments, being poor in spirit, mourning, being meek and hungering and thirsting for righteousness or justice are not presented here as characteristics that people should exhibit if they want to earn God's favor. Rather, these are undesirable conditions that characterize no one when God's will is done. Put this up on our next occasion as we shift to Westminster. Theological Journal and the Discussion of Social Trinitarianism in an article entitled Engaging Trinitarian and New Matological Models, Social Trinitarianism. Regarding the second common objection, whether social model proponents correctly interpret the patristic sources Vandenbrink rightly rejects the East versus West thesis and accepts the pro-Nicene proposal. As a result, he actually admits that the Cappadocian fathers cannot be considered as advocates or perhaps even precursors of social Trinitarianism. However, he doubles down on the social model's patristic preference avowing that contemporary social Trinitarians can turn to the Capodichians for drawing inspiration from their work. This statement seems to be more of a concession to the objection, as well as consequent minor redirection of a social approach and an actual rebuttal of the objection. Responding to the third objection, whether the social model possesses sufficient basis in the biblical text, Vandenbrink concludes that the social Trinitarianism is not ruled out by the Old Testament, whereas more positively it is suggested by important strands of the New Testament. It seems to me that the Dutch scholars simply trying to show that the biblical witness allows for the three-in-one understanding of divinity, but such a conclusion does not favor the social model over the classical model, since both approaches affirm or should one God, three persons formula. Persuasive power only maintains if one approach can establish that the biblical data supports the particular understanding of divine unity and personal distinction. Vandenbrink, however, does not proffer supporting evidence, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Old Testament. Shifting to Mid-America Theological Journal, we start a new article. Should effectual calling and regeneration be distinguished by Dr. Cornelius Venema? 
one of the axioms of good theological formulation and definition is expressed in the phrase, he who distinguishes well, teaches well. The point of the expression is that in our definition of theological topics and subjects, distinct matters need to be distinguished clearly, even though they may be inseparable in other respects. To distinguish one topic from another serves to prevent confusion. The companion to this axiom is the expression, distinction but not separation, distinctio sed non separatio. And the enterprise of theology, clear thinking often requires that topics be distinguished or, but not separated. A classic illustration is the point of the Christological formulation in the Council of Chalcedon 451. Christ is one and the same person, yet having two distinct but inseparable natures. In the history of theology, distinguishing without separating is particularly significant in formulating the order of salvation, the ordo salutis. Though reservations have been expressed about the validity of seeking to develop an order of salvation, theologians have found it necessary to distinguish the various benefits of Christ's saving work that are communicated to believers by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For an extensive analysis of the formulation of the Ordo Salutis in early Reformed theology, see Richard Mueller's Calvin and the Reformed Tradition, page 160 to 201. For general discussion of the propriety and biblical basis for the elaboration of the Ordo Salutis, See Anthony Hukama, Saved by Grace. Also John Murray, Redemption, Accomplished and Applied. It may be one of the finest books around on this terse, concise, and precise. Also Gerhard is his Reform Dogmatics. Also, Burkauer, Karl Barth is referred here, Studies in Dogmatics. Barth and Burkauer criticize the formulation of an ordo salutis, arguing that it tends to detract attention from the saving work of Christ and present an unduly psychologized form, Barth's view. Well, I'm ready to concede that this may happen in some formulations of the Order of Salutis. There's ample biblical evidence for identifying the distinct yet inseparable benefits of Christ's saving work that are imparted to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I look forward to reading Dr. Venema's work. We finish in now here a book review. I am a Christian, the nun, the devil, and Martin Luther. It's an interesting story of Luther. And of course, Luther did not believe that God pressed these devilish attacks into his own providential purposes for the purpose of strengthening Christians. This is about some of Luther's sermon illustrations. As Christ's own trials after baptism strengthened him, this theodicy so foreign to contemporary thinking was the other side of Luther's rebuking and scorning the devil in the face of the devil's attempts to cause Christians to despair of divine love. It was critical to Luther that even the experience of the darkest unfectum was in the end a human good. The devil was not only in Satan's God's grasp, the devil was in a certain sense God's servant. The remainder of Schneider's book is given over to several tasks. First, the author attempts to identify the woman in the story. 
There was no one woman, Schneider concludes, but a composite woman, refashioned in various ways, but with the same persistent need to ward off the devilish on Factum. Then she speculates on the possible connection of the thought of the two different nuns, Mechthild of Heckenberg and Mechthild of Modenburg, among 22 14th century German nuns of that name, to Luther's baptismal defense against the de devil's accusations. Though these are speculations, Schneider does manage to convincingly tie the world of late medieval spirituality in a positive sense to Luther's spirituality. And finally, Schneider suggests some trajectory of usefulness for Luther's story in contemporary society. This is a worthwhile book not so much for any novel scholarly insights into Luther, but most certainly for its creative and competent approach to Luther's pastoral theology. Almost done with that edition. We're expecting a new edition of Anglican and Episcopal history here shortly. We turn to the Global Anglican in this exquisite article on the atonement and several aspects presented of the one atonement, inseparable aspects, distinguished, talked about the substitutionary nature of the atonement so viciously denied by the, mo the decadent ones, the sacrificial work of Christ, the ransom, the law court imagery of justice, the family image of adoption and reconciliation, and now for the moral exemplar and the victory dimensions of the atonement. There is scriptural support for this model of the example theory, in particular the repeated examples to follow Christ's example, such as John's gospel, where Jesus is disciples are encouraged to follow Jesus's example of servant leadership and serve one another, such as in the foot washing. Jesus's death is seen as a demonstration of the depth of God's love for us, which prompts us to repentance and changing our lives and confessing that God is right. The effect of the atonement is therefore primary in this understanding. The limitation to this image are not hard to understand. In the first place, the model does not seem to match the reality of the world. Namely, try as hard as we may, we cannot defeat the sin that is within us. As Hart points out, the model has a clear tendency to endorse modernity's optimistic assessment of human condition and human potentialities. Indeed, the moral understanding of Jesus's ministry and death does, does not see an objective change either within us or the cosmos, since the love of God and participation in God's family can be found in the Old Testament. As Hart comments, God's character in the Bible is not simply based on love, it is fused with other characteristics such as holiness and justice, something that is so emphatically disliked also in the efforts to reshape God's character. The sixth inseparable element connected to the all comprehensive and efficacious atonement in this image, victory of the atonement, humanity is viewed as being enslaved to the powers of sin, the world, and the devil. And God wins a victory over those powers to free his people. Gustav Aulin was a major proponent of this important image. The victory motif recurs throughout the Gospels as Jesus demonstrates victory over the effects of the enemy's power in the form of the devil's temptations 
demons, sickness, and even death. The victory is also reflected elsewhere in the New Testament, Colossians 2, 1 John 3, and 5. The victory image then provides an explanation of the atonement based on Jesus' life and resurrection. And bring that to a close, that's going to then move in the direction of, after looking at the atonement, how is that reflected in the new book of order? I think it's an English book. Now turn our attention to the Reformed Presbyterian Journal. Uh, they've just uh, concluded an article, a eulogy on the passing of Reverend John Cannon in 1836. Now they're reporting, started a report of committee on correspondence with America. As the Church of Scotland, that are the Covenanters in Scotland are communicating with the Covenanters in America. The circumstance of there being on our table a recent communication from only one of the sections into which the Reformed Presbyterian Church has been divided prevents us from entering fully on the topic. At the same time, our affectionate concern for the union of our American brethren with one another and with us in the cause of truth will not permit us to remain altogether silent. It's talking about the split peas, the Presbyterian splitting, the physiparous nature among some Presbyterians. The Senate are most, and that comes from their uh, close thinking, the Senate are most solicitous to perpetuate ecclesiastical union with our American brethren, on the ground upon which this union has been formed and hitherto maintained. They and we have agreed not only in general principles respecting magistrates, magistracy, in other words, they would not take an oath of allegiance unless the government would declare allegiance to Jesus Christ as the head of the universe. It's unnecessary to remind our brethren of the protest against the civil constitution of these realms under which the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Britain has been formed and of the practical separation which we have endeavored to maintain of the application of our general principles in this country our brethren in America have expressed their approbation as many of them have done before they left the country of their fathers this Scotland the Synod have always understood that there was a similar application of our general principles to the American civil institutions, particularly the federal government. Very fascinating, logical application. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you must insist by way of logic that the civil government recognize that lordship of infinite sovereignty. Against its participation in the system of slavery, against the absence in it of any recognition of Christianity or even of a deity, and against the promiscuous admission into offices of persons irrespective of moral or spiritual qualification, our brethren in America had faithfully testified and upon this footing had maintained a distinct ecclesiastical standing among American churches. The Senate are assured of this, not only from the correspondence and writings of individuals, but from the authorized exposition of her views by the church herself and well-known practices. Upon this footing, the Reformed Presbyterian churches in Europe and America were united their members and the intercourse obtaining between the countries had readily made a similar application of their similar principles to respective civil institutions as providence cast their lot. 
our brethren assuming the ground of the American church in this particular when they emigrated to the United States and as readily resuming the same ground with us when they returned to Europe. Wonderful. Raises that question for us. Speaking of Presbyterians, the Princeton Theological Journal of 1837 with the internecine bickering over a General Assembly of 1836 about the Foreign Missionary Board. And it's really an unedifying piece insofar as we can assess. We undertook to show that this was a mistake, that the plan had been in contemplation long before that convention was called, that it had been recommended in all its essential features by the late Dr. Rice. We are so unfortunate as on this account to have incurred the author's particular displeasure. Towards the conclusion of his severe rebuke, he says of us, quote, it is presumed they will never make these declarations again, and that hereafter should they ever allow themselves to write with haste and carelessness, as a matter of fact, which are manifested in their review of the General Assembly of 1836, they will confine themselves to topics concerning which there exists no documentary evidence, close quote. How far this severity is merited will appear from the following. The question is, did the project of a board of foreign missions under the care of the General Assembly originate with the Pittsburgh Convention, or had it been contemplated and desired at an earlier period? The author can hardly object to the statement of the point at issue, as it is not only the form in which we presented it, but the very heading of his third chapter proposes it nearly in the same form. As we had the best possible evidence that the proposal had been in contemplation and had been made a subject of extended and prayerful consultation years before the Pittsburgh Convention was even thought of, we little thought we should incur anyone's indignation by saying so. Oh, we, this is really some wonky tonky in house denominational bickering. All we ask of our read, but at least we get a picture of 1837, Princeton, a seminary, Pittsburgh seminary. The very time of the reorganization of the Board of Missions in 1828, it was formally declared to be authorized to conduct missions in any part of the world. The following resolution was passed, as we believe, by common consent by the General Assembly of that year, quote, resolve that the Board of Missions already have the power to establish missions, not only among the destitute in our country, but among the heathen in any part of the world, to select, appoint, and commission missionaries to determine their their salaries and to settle and pay their accounts that they have full authority to correspond with any other body on the subject of missions. We'll pick this up again. A bit wonky for us. And now we turn to the Protestant Reform Journal Introduction of Church Holidays. It from the Harifa near the Kirkrek. In the West, as the third century, December 25, was considered oops, to be the day of Christ's birth without the day being celebrated as a feast day, why the 25th of December was set as the date of Christ's birth cannot be determined without certainty. It is certain that the ecclesiastical celebration of that day was established in Rome in the middle of the 4th century, according to Duquesne in the year 336, and according to Usner and Harnack in the year 354. 
Christmas celebration spread to the East. What was introduced into Constantinople by Gregory Nazianzus. Since that time, the celebration of the feast was universal in the church. Before long, it was seen as the high point of God's work of mercy, the great feast on which one should abstain from all work, on which even the slave should rest. Fasting was forbidden on the day. The joy had to be spiritual. Public and worldly feasting was forbidden. In order to make an impression on the people, ecclesiastics introduced beautiful ceremonies and dramatic presentations that directed the eye away from the Savior. How very, how very prejudicial is that? Furthermore, in many churches, there was a custom of going early in the morning to church where there was a crib with a ch Christ child in order to rock the child. Presentations were made of the stall with an ox and an ass by the crib. These silly performances reached their epitome in the so-called fool's feasts, a deformation of the old Roman Saturnalia, where an all clergyman appeared in the church dressed not only in animal masks, but also women and magicians. In place of sacred songs, disgusting tunes were sung. In the place of the host, sausages were placed on the altar. All kinds of lewdness occurred in public places. The church was forced to take strong measures against these sins by the 15th century. We shift now to Concordia Theological Journal, hoping for this article to end. The conclusion, Sassy set forth a great deal on the office up to the years of 1933 and 34. We summarize as briefly as possible. The office depends upon the Christological substance of the faith and delivers the gospel by word and sacrament. When the dogmatic substance of Christ is lost, the gospel is turned into something else and sociological definitions of the church obtain. The office loses its proper tasks, whether in German liberalism or the American social gospel movement, the pastor becomes the religious virtuoso, the great leader and not the deliverer of Christ. When the office is based on personality, the office is destroyed. These Convictions were clarified in Sass's personal experience in war, in the office, and in the conversations in the faith and order movement. This is pre-World War II. The church is where Christ is. Christ is in word and sacrament. The office delivers this Christ. In the, the pastor speaks both in the name of of the congregation and in the name of Christ. The alternatives look to sociology and end in one, one of the merit, many versions of churchless mysticism. Augsburg Confession 16, the two realms, defines the office also by what it does not do. Attempts to Christianize the world, church only secularizes the church. Well, we turn from that to Princeton Theological Review, Cyril Nestorius and Schleiermacher with Adam Hebb. And he's made his beginnings and starting to expound Schleiermacher in relation to Cyril and Nestorius. Schleiermacher writes, and Schleiermacher doesn't like Cyril or Nestorius, or Chalcedonianism for that matter. The Redeemer then is like all men in virtue of the identity of human nature, but distinguishes them from all by the constant potency of his God consciousness, which was a veritable existence of God in him. So 
Jesus is the best of the breed. Is this another variety of Arianism? We'll soon see. Combined with this move is Schleiermacher's attempt to naturalize the appearance of the constantly potent God consciousness in such a way that preconditions for it exist within every person. Yeah, it's Arianism. Perhaps Schleiermacher's redefinition of the meaning of incarnation is most clearly seen in his interpretation of the verse that is so central to Cyril's views. The word became flesh, John 1.14. Of this work, Schleiermacher writes, Word is the activity of God expressed in the form of consciousness. So he just depersonalized the Lagos. It's God consciousness. In short, the word becoming flesh is equivalent to a human experiencing a constant and powerful God consciousness. It's Arianism in another name. In the foregoing, we've seen that Schleiermacher does indeed reconceptualize the incarnation in a unique way. If Cyril's thesis that the incarnation determines the conceptual structure of the doctrine of the atonement is correct, then the innovation introduced by Schleiermacher to the doctrine of the incarnation should lead to a corollary innovation in his view of redemption. Let's see where this goes. There are two ways that Schleiermacher's view of redemption confirms Cyril's thesis. First, he reinterprets the meaning of redemption using terms that correlate to his previous redefinition of Christ's divinity as God consciousness. While Schleiermacher affirms the importance of Christ's suffering and death, he limits this importance to the display of Christ's imperturbable blessedness and their demonstration of his sympathy and love for humanity. Where are we going to find sacrificial atonement, substitutionary atonement, penal and retributive justice, double imputation, adoption, ransom, Again, is this going to be a redefinition that divests Christ's cross of the atoning sacrifice? We'll soon see. Schleiermacher does not view redemption as entailing the transformation of corrupt humanity in the sense proposed by Cyril's model of theosis. And I'm not sure theosis is the only thing that Cyril went after. Is there an implicit denial of forensic justification here by Mr. Adam Heeb in Princeton Theological Review? Nor does he advance a forensic model drawn from Pauline texts concerning our legal justification before God. That's some footnotes. Schleiermacher, the divine activity in Christ which enables the manifestation of his unique God consciousness is the singular, single and continuous divine act of preservation operative within each of us. It's Arianism, Schleiermacher argues. And again, another quote here. In spite of these statements, Schleiermacher despises, disparages the Ebionitic view of the person of Christ which leaves no room for any essential distinction between Christ and an exceptional man. Yet he seems to display ebionitic tendencies in that extent of the essential distinction between Christ and any other person uniquely motivated. Rather, Schleiermacher believes that redemption consists of humanity's reception of Christ's constant and powerful God consciousness. We'll pick that up as we go. And now in this wonky article on Christian Platonism and Christological interpretation, 
Dr. Trier is engaging with Craig Carter's um, metaphysical participation in the reading of the Bible with the church fathers. But I'm not sure exactly what he's saying because it is not clear. Christian Platonism providentially inherited. Assessing Christian Platonism requires careful definitions and discerning appreciation for divine providence. Anti-nominalism narratives from the likes of John Milbank, Bragg Gregory, and Mil Michael Gillespie, whom Carter approvingly cites, minimize the internal problems that fostered Christian Platonism's late medieval decline. Conversely, anti-physical narratives from the likes of McCormick minimized divine providence in the early Christian period. They almost imply that Christian Platonism is so unbiblical as to render the Incarnation's timing unwise. Of course, Galatians 4.4 need not imply a comprehensive embrace of Greco-Roman culture. But on some Bardian accounts, biblical narrative requires an actualistic ontology that would have been very difficult to develop in a Hellenistic cultural context. What in the world are you saying? Reduce this to a, take the wonkiness out of it. For Richard Bauckham, however, who influenced by Moltmann, is no friend of divine impassibility now highlights the appearance of Hellenistic true God language in the New Testament itself. Uh, subsequently, if thinkers such as Walls and Betty Aqua are correct, then Hellenistic conceptualization precludes both comprehensive normativity and the complete rejection of Christian Platonism. At least, to the, and by the way, Craig Carter wrote a brilliant article on how to read the Bible. It's marvelous. Instead of agreeing with the flatlining metaphysicians whose God rises no higher than the eight foot ceiling up here, with crummy, no doctor really of providence, uh, Craig Carter argues for reading with God is. God speaking from another world by his word. Perhaps, therefore, Protestant hermeneutics cannot be disentangled from classic ontological commitments as readily as many biblical scholars believe. In this regard, Proven's recent book seriously engages Luther's and Calvin's hermeneutical texts to make several contributions, such as its definition of seriously literal interpretation, its defense of the Protestant canon, its delineation of an unfashionable but still meaningful distinction between typology and allegory, its discussion of the Septuagint's authority, and its sensible depictions of various critical methods. We'll try, hopefully this will come together at some later point. We're now in the Southwest Theological Journal, switching to that. And the, the article on the use of the Old Testament in the Petrine letters and Jude. James, 1st, 2nd Peter and Jude. So we pick up there as he's discussing the use throughout Peter his letters that they make a sustained use of the Old Testament. Unjust suffering and the example of Christ in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. Peter's use of Isaiah 53 emphasizes both the exemplary and redemptive nature of Christ's undeserved suffering in relation to the theme of righteousness. Although without sin, Christ bore our sins so that we might live to righteousness. 1 Peter 2.24, Care and Job helpfully depicts Peter's interaction with Isaiah 53, 
by putting quotations in bold and allusions in italics, who did not commit sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, himself bore our sins, by whose wounds ye are healed. For you were like wandering sheep, did not retaliate, did not make threats, trusted the one who judges rightly, justly. Scholars recognize, however, that 1 Peter 2:21 to 25 involves more than the use of Isaiah 53. David observes that the writer flows unconsciously from the citation of Isaiah into a description of the crucifixion. The concluding phrase, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls, does not come from Isaiah 53. Peter could have in mind such passages as Isaiah 40, Psalm 23, Ezekiel 34, 11 to 13. <clears throat> the summary exhortation in Psalm 34, as seen in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12, and a summary exhortation to all believers, which highlights love, compassion, and humility as over against a retaliatory spirit. Peter draws again from Psalm 34, 1 Peter 2, 3 through 6, in what is the longest quotation from the Old Testament in the letter, 1 Peter 3, 10 to 12. The portion of the psalm quoted supports Peter's ethical teaching to pursue righteousness and to turn away from evil. The author's prior reflection on Isaiah 53 may have brought this psalm to mind in the admonition to keep one's tongue from speaking deceit. 1 Peter 3.10 and we'll, bring the, we'll pick that up again as we turn to Thamelios in the article on Psalm 2. He's taken us through uh, the sermons and acts in Paul's writings, uh, Hebrews, uh, James, or Revelation, I'm sorry. And now he brings us to his conclusion. Psalm 2 is a psalm of hope. Despite the accumulation of antagonistic kings and active rebellion, <coughs> Yahweh enthrones <coughs> his vicegerent in Zion. He proceeds to adopt this son, king as son. The result is a declaration that only by submitting to Yahweh and his anointed may the rebellious kings of the nation avoid divine judgment. For readers of the Psalter, this was a confession of hope. Initially, this hope is placed in each successive Davidic king enthroned in Jerusalem. However, as the decades passed, the circumstances deteriorated, and the kings did that which was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. Some beautiful, clear writing here compared to that other piece. Clear writing. Give me a Bishop Old Hugh Latimer, direct, clear, racy, illustrative, helpful, practical, while without compromising doctrine. Thank you here for this article. Psalms such as Psalm 2 must be read like vicious sarcasm. <laughs> Nevertheless, those who compiled the Psalter kept Psalm 2 and other royal psalms in the collection. As a result, Psalm 2 being set in tandem with Psalm 1, he argued earlier that Psalm 1 was individual, 2 is Psalm 2, Yahweh, in the corporate sense. At the beginning of the Psalter, envisages a righteous Davidic king. The style and substance of the Psalm support this reading. The content depicts a Davidite who is known intimately by Yahweh and rules the nations on his behalf and at his bidding. And we're reminded of our article of the white horse riding through time and history, conquering 
as the Lamb seated on the throne of God effectuates the contents of the book of eternal decrees with infinite ease and with one arm tied behind his back. Glorious stuff from Revelation. He's not bringing it in here. I'm throwing it in. The New Testament readings of Psalm 2, briefly noted above, further substantiate this claim as they understand Psalm 2 to be filled, fulfilled in the son of David, Jesus of Nazareth. Stein observes, quote, at the time of the early church, this hermeneutical bridge was already built, close quote. This article then has demonstrated that while Psalm 2 almost certainly originated from a historical event with references to an actual king, its placement in this altar, it becomes a signpost pointing its reader to the future hope of the coming Davidic king. In this way, the Christian Bible documents, unfolds, and realizes the Old Testament hope. We'll pick that up in our next edition. As we turn to this meandering article by the editor of the Journal of Theological Studies, 1908. The article is entitled, Cephas and Christ. A bit of a meandering article. We pick up there, since in all man there is planted a passion for knowledge of the future, and by reason of this passion, they turn to sacrifices and all forms of divination in the hope of discovering certainty thereby. But these are full of uncertainty and are always self-detected. Such means, therefore, Moses strenuously forbids them to follow. But he says that if they are truly pious, they shall not go wanting in knowledge of the future. No, suddenly appearing a prophet, divinely inspired, shall give oracles and say nothing of his own. For not even if he says can be, can comprehend it, if he really be possessed and wrapped. For the prophets are God's interpreters. He uses their organs to signify his will. He is Jeremiah. St. Matthew inserts a fourth opinion, which is perhaps a closer definition or particular form of the third. Others said Jeremiah or one of the prophets. The view that Jeremiah was the promised prophet like Moses is expounded in the Midrash in a document incorporated in the second book of the Maccabees. It is told on the authority of the records of the writing how Jeremiah bade the tabernacle and ark follow him to the mountain, whence Moses beheld God's heritage and hid them there until God should gather his people. Later in the body of the same book, Judas relates to his followers a vision which he had seen. And the vision of that dream was this. He saw Onias, him that was a high priest, a noble and good man, reverend and bearing, yet gentle in manner and well-spoken, and exercised from a child in all points of virtue, with outstretched hands invoking blessings on the whole body of the Jews. Thereupon he saw a man appear of venerable age and exceeding glory, and wonderful and most majestic was the dignity around him. And Onias answered and said, This is the lover of the brethren, he who prayeth much for the people in the holy city, Jeremiah, the prophet of God. Jeremiah, stretching forth his right hand, delivered to Judas a sword of gold, and in giving it addressed him, saying, Take the holy sword, a gift from God, wherewith thou shalt smite down thine adversaries. Finally, an illustration of this idea of the present activity and future reign of Jeremiah, the congener of Moses, 
one may quote a passage from Philo in which he ranks Jeremiah almost on a level with Moses. We'll pick that up in our next edition. As we turn to the Hedgehog Review, by an article by Dr. Wilfred McClay, which is pointing out, point received, noted and received about the prevalence, persistence of guilt, individual, corporate, and even national. It's a fascinating article. Because try as one might, individually, corporately, or nationally, guilt is not simply removed by saying so. Nietzsche said, no God, no guilt. So we get World War I with the Treaty of Versailles, which talked about national guilt, which Hitler hated. We had World War II, and Germans are still trying in some way to atone for that, all of that. Whatever became of sin, asked the psychiatrist Carl Menninger in his 1973 book of that title. What in the new arrangements of modernity and secularity can accomplish the moral and transactional work that was formerly done by now discarded concepts. If thanks to Nietzsche, the absence of belief in God is the notional condition of modern Western culture, as Paula Fredrickson argues in her study of the concept of sin, doesn't that mean that the idea of sin is finished too? Yet it would seem to mean just that. After all, sin cannot be understood apart from the larger context of ideas. So what happens when all ideas that upheld sin in its earlier sense have ceased to be normatively embraced? Could not the answer to manager's question be something like Zarathustra's famous cry, sin is dead and we have killed it. Sin is a transgression of God, but without a God, how can there be anything such as sin? So the theory, it would seem to dictate. But as Fredrickson argues, that theory fails miserably to explain the world we inhabit. Sin lives on, it seems, even if we decline that particular name. We live, she says, in the well web of culture and the biblical God seems to have taken up pers persistent residence in the Western imagination, so much so that even non-believers seem to know exactly who or what it is they do not believe in. In fact, given the anger that so many unbelievers evince towards this non-existent God, one might be tempted to speculate whether their unconscious cry is this, Lord, I do not believe. Please strengthen my belief in your non-existence. Such was Nietzsche's genius in communicating how difficult an achievement a clean and unconditional atheism is, a conundrum that he captured not by asserting that God does not exist, but by his vicious and vigorous assertions that God is dead. For the existence of the dead constitutes for us a presence as well as an absence. It is not so easy to wish that enduring presence away, particularly when there is a lingering sense that the presence was once something living and breathing. We'll pick that up later. We're now in the seed and harvest, winter 2021, with some uh, memorials from the alumnus, alumni of Trinity School of Ministry. 2019, Reverend Isaiah Brooms was named associate pastor at Falls Church Anglican in Virginia. Reverend Terry Gatward accepted a call to become rector of All Saints Anglican in Monroe, L.A., where he will serve under Bishop Ryan Reed, Bishop of the Diocese of Fort Worth. 
2321, Trish and Reverend Newman Lawrence welcome their new daughter, Mary and Margaret. Reverend Ben Wolpe and Steffi welcome, welcome their third son on February 2021. Reverend Zhu was ordained to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament in the North American Lutheran Church. Ray is the pastor of the Chinese Lutheran Church, Honolulu. 2020, Mrs. Shannon Fuller and the Reverend Andrew Fuller welcomed their first child. Ann Fuller moved to State College, PA, where Shannon will complete a pastoral internship. Andrew will serve as deacon and assist the rector, Mike Newborough, Incarnation Anglican Church. It looks like they're only dealing with the Anglican Church in North America these days. It used to serve the Episcopal Church of the U.S. But <clears throat> very little recognition of that. Uh, Reverend Eric Phillips, ordained priest, June 12, 2021, by Reverend Grant, Bishop Grant Lamont on behalf of the interim bishop of Pittsburgh, which bishop, TEC. 2021, Laura Baum ordained to the Sacred Order of Deacons by Bishop Mark Wrights at Grace Anglican, Little Silver, South Carolina. Uh, Bishop George Sumner, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, ordained Miguel Carmona to the Sacred Order of Deacons in the Cathedral Church of St. Matthews in Dallas. That would be TEC. On behalf of Bishop Martin Martins, Bishop Grant LaMacarn ordained Michael Husted to the Sacred Order of Deacons at Prince of Peace Anglican Church, Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. Eric Lar Larson welcomed their new son, Elias Larson, February 23, 21. Eric's original essay, Chalcedonian Hermeneutics of the Word, a proposal to use the incarnational analogy to overcome a division between biblical and theological studies, was awarded first place in 2021 Wycliffe Scripture and Theology essay. Requiem's Reverend Hewitt Fleming, 1997, died at 73, March 28, from COVID complications. He served as record rector of Good Shepherd Church in Hazelwood, neighborhood of Pitt, Pittsburgh, and was also a trustee of Trinity from 1998 to 2018. We'll bring that to an end. It's got some more memorials of people who died, and a really young guy here at age 40. We'll pick that up later as we turn to this exquisite article um, hi, Rocky. Oh, good to see you. Am I missing getting? Good to see all of you. Thank you all for participating. Glad to have you here. This is an exquisite article that's giving us details of the 30 years from 1892 to 1930, actually, what, 40 years of how fundamentalism arose. Um, just call me a fundamentalist, one of those backwoods prophets, right? And this is looking at the Presbyterian side, but it affected other denominations. Most notably, McCartney, it's Reverend Dr. McCartney of Arch Street Presbyterian Philadelphia fighting with the decadent ones in the Presbyterian Church, but he ultimately kind of compromises, became a beacon of light in the midst of peril of storms for Harold O.J. Ockument, Ockengay, but my dad sat under his ministry in Boston. When the young Westminster graduated and turned briefly under him at First Presbyterian before his 33-year tenure at Park Street, Boston, it's Uncharitable, therefore, to dismiss McCartney in the way one Lutheran described him a decade after the crisis. McCartney often mediates between Christian confessionalism and liberal concessionalism. That's nice, wrote Theodore Mueller. That's very nice. 
that's to call it uncharitable it's just an accurate statement we want to state it meekly and truthfully with salt and light liberal concessionalism but what does seem to characterize McCartney's ministry is the atrophying of ecclesiological categories in his posture against theological liberalism Historian Bradley Longfield has suggested that the controversy in the mainline Presbyterian Church was followed by a brief and fragile peace that was shattered by theological fragmentation in the 1960s, and where they, in 1967, they gave up their confession officially. Ultimately, it reached the point where a 1988 General Assembly report wrote. Our unity is merely formal, and our diversity is divisive, owing to the lack of clear biblical and creedal boundaries. Observers of contemporary evangelicalism have identified similar fragmentation, as it also struggles with the erosion of biblical boundaries and the decline of confessional identity. If McCartney's effort to sustain a co coherent conservative opposition to liberalism proved inadequate, it may suggest that there are still lessons from Fosnick's sermon and its aftermath that the church needs to learn a century later. We finish that article. We'll be picking up on our next edition, Machen. Fosdick was just, for Machen, Fosdick was a small part of the problem. And indeed, that's a very true observation. We turn now to Theologian You Should Know with Dr. M Michael Reeves. We're talking about <clears throat> Ignatius, who died in 110. This is because for Ignatius, the bishop represents Christ to the church. The second concern on Ignatius's mind in his several letters as he travels from Antioch, Syria to Rome to be fed to the lions in the Colosseum was the problem of false teaching. In particular, Ignatius had two types of false teachers in mind, Docetists and Judaizers, both of whom denied in their own way that Christ had come in the flesh, 1 John 1. The Docetists maintain that Jesus was entirely divine and that he only appeared to be human. The name Docetic comes from the Greek word dakeo, to seem or to appear. Perhaps the most notorious Docetic teacher was Marcion who taught that the good savior God of the New Testament is different from that meanie creator God of the Old Testament. Jesus on Marcion's view had nothing to do with the evil creator's physical world. And so Christ could not have taken on a physical body, could not have been born, eaten, died and so forth. In stark opposition, Ignatius would speak boldly of the blood of Christ. For if the divine Christ had not truly assumed our humanity, then he could not have died for our sins. In fact, Ignatius's entire motivation in accepting martyrdom was based on his belief in the real incarnation of Christ. Ignatius longed for martyrdom because then he would be copying Christ. But if Christ did not suffer in his body, then Ignatius could not be copying him at all. Quote, if that is the case, I die for no reason, he wrote. Instead, Ignatius wanted his life and death to proclaim that there is only one physician who is both flesh and spirit, born and unborn, God and man, true life and death, both from Mary and from God. God first subject to suffering and then beyond suffering, Jesus Christ our Lord. It is hard to read such material and not be incredulous of the claim that Jesus' full divinity and full humanity 
is a later 4th century invention. The other type of false teacher Ignatius was eager to arm Christians against, particularly Magnesia and Philadelphia, was the Judaizer, who taught that Christians must abide by Jewish customs, especially circumcision and the Mosaic law, showing that the Judaizers continued after Paul. Well, we turn to our next article, Journal of Biblical Theological Studies, an introduction to Catholicity. And they're going to offer several articles from individual faith traditions have their own edition, own version of what the word Catholic means. Um, questions that will be tackled. He's talking about the pedo, credo, credo Baptist, infant baptizers, right? Uh, immersionist Baptists. How is their view of baptism Catholic? How are the distinctives of their view not out of line with tradition, rejecting baptismal regeneration? How does their view of baptism relate to the other theological traditions? Would you or would you not allow church membership to those who come seeking it, but with a different view of the mode or subject of subjects of baptism? How does their view of baptism impact the practice of the Eucharist or Lord's Supper? The editors want to thank the contributors for their work in this issue. We found the planning and edit editing process extremely edifying as we, in some small ways, help to foster denominational dialogues in this important subject. We want to thank Peter Leithart and Luke Stamps for their graciousness and charitableness. In the end, we want this small volume to help cultivate greater understanding, perspective, and appreciation among different Christians throughout the world. Greater understanding does not always or even usually mean greater agreement, but it should lead to an increasing and ever abounding humility and sympathy towards those with whom you degree. Disagree. Our prayer along these lines echoes Jesus's prayer in John 17, that we, the church, may be one, even as the Son is with the Father. And John 17, 20 to 23, I prayed that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be so in the world that the world may believe in it that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, or that they may be brought to complete unity. The positive vision of Catholicity is a pursuit of the visible unity of the church. Good, good luck, son. Therefore, we offer this collection to the church Catholic to both students and scholars of the Bible and theology, and to all those around the world who cling to Jesus in the hope of the consummation <clears throat> and restoration of the universal bride of Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And we'll bring that article to an end. We'll, next time we'll be talking about part one, a house with many rooms, Catholicity in denominational perspective. And for our last article from the New Horizons of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, first article, Reflection, this is the June 2022 20, edition, Reflections on the Goodness of Our Lord by the Reverend Mark T. Rube. Um, In what has come to be known as the Great Commission, our Savior, shortly before he returned to the Father in heaven, commanded his apostles and through his disciples to disciple, teach, and baptize and to this day churches that would be faithful to observe all that he had commanded us and missionaries to the nations. Following the pattern of scripture, these young church plants on the mission field by his grace 
grow in their wholehearted embrace of the system of doctrine that is taught in the scripture and reflected in our Reformed confessions. All over time, we see them also grow in their ability to provide for their own needs and for those of the poor around them. As the Lord provides sound and godly ministers, elders, and deacons, and in turn to continue the process of carrying out the Great Commission to the next village, and then to another halfway around the world. This is a pro process that usually takes some time. Often it's multi-generational, and that requires patience, self-restraint, waiting upon the Lord with our eyes always fixed on Jesus. An adventure in grace. For the past 31 years, as General Secretary of the Committee on Foreign Missions, it has been a joy and privilege, an adventure in grace, if you will, to see with my own eyes the wonders of his hand at work through the labors of your missionaries as they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, press on faithfully to gather and build his church in faraway corners of the globe. And as his word has been earnestly and lovingly proclaimed in distant lands to thousands who are otherwise perishing in their sins, Time and again, we've witnessed his spirit apply that word to the hearts of his precious ones to cause them to repent of their sins and to flee in faith to our Savior, each case, which is a supernatural work. Have you ever seen the look in someone's face when it begins to dawn on him or her that there might be forgiveness of sins? We're all sinners, and apart from Christ, we all carry the terrible burden of our sins around with us every day. Christ tells us in his word that all people who have ever lived know that there is a God to whom they will one day give an answer, but that they suppress this knowledge, exchanging the truth for a lie. But we all know that unless Christ comes first, we're going to die. And then one day someone, perhaps even a strange foreigner from a different culture, comes and opens up the gospel for the first time that there is repentance and there is forgiveness of sins. And that they safely can flee in faith to Christ and know that he will never turn them away. And the warming in their faces is a wonderful peace, sometimes tears of joy and in keen anticipation in delighting in finding their newly found savior. We'll bring this edition to a close. The Lord be for us, who can be against us? And as Jesus taught, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here ends this session of Theological Journals. And good to see you, Mary and Rocchio, and any others who have visited. Godspeed.